morning, and who are the students who are, who are still not quite a DC? Thanks for coming in in August, right? Your month off? That's fantastic. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, they're supposed to be on break, but that's great. They're anxious to learn. Uh, welcome to Third Thursday at Northwestern. This is co-sponsored by Northwestern Health Sciences University's Human Performance Center and the Minnesota Chiropractic Association. This is a, a monthly event that we have talking about sports and performance, and we have a different speaker each month. Um, this month we have Trevor Foshang, the Dean of the Chiropractic Program here at Northwestern and a chiropractic radiologist. He's going to talk about sports radiology and I'll let him introduce himself in this topic. Next month we have Sarah Kupris. Uh, many of you know her. She's going to talk about integrating athletic trainers into a sports chiropractic office. So I think that's going to be a, a great topic as well. And then the following month, what does that make us? October? Where are we at here? Yeah, October. Um, October we have uh, Tim Howie. Tim Howie's a paramedic. A local paramedic, 20 plus years of, uh, of paramedicing. I made that word up. Um, <laughs> yeah, here in the Minneapolis area, he's brilliant. Though some some of you out there have uh, taken his EMT course, he's uh, brilliant. And I asked him if uh, if he does football games and other types of sporting events, and he does tons of them. And I thought it would be a great opportunity for us as future sports chiropractors to be able to hear from a paramedic's perspective on on how to integrate a paramedic into a sports chiropractic environment or a sporting environment. Well, again, thank you for coming in the back. If you haven't signed in, please sign in. You know I'm always checking that list and counting heads, so I want to make sure that we have accurate heads, head counts, and please help yourself to the coffee and, and biscuits back there. Sorry, that was a little Aussie that came out of me, biscuits. Um, so I'd like to have Dr. Fosheng come to the microphone, and he can get started and introduce himself. Thank you, Dr. Stark. So some of you know who I am. Some of you do not. So thank you for all being here. Um, this is the you said the eighth of the of the year. Yeah. So I think this is a really a great opportunity for you guys to learn something that is maybe co-curricular, uh, and then bring people that are not typically on on campus onto campus. So wonderful. So a uh, really quick brief history of myself. Uh, practiced a little bit after I did a radiology residency up in Canada, Thunder Bay, Ontario. Practiced there for about three years uh, prior to getting back into the academic world. So I, I speak from both a, uh, a practical perspective as well as a consultant perspective. Uh, the topic today, of course, is imaging decisions and the athlete. So one thing I, I want to make sure of is that we are interactive today. This is really um, not only just me imparting information, but you, of course, asking lots of questions. So don't be afraid to ask lots of, lots of questions. So what is it that we'll talk about today? Uh, really two things. I want to review the types of imaging that is typically used uh, in, in the sense of imaging of the, of the body and the athlete in particular. And when I do that, I want us to think of, of the tissue types that we're talking about when we're doing the imaging piece. And then I'm going to do a little review of, uh, of clinical predictive rules. And I've got a couple of, of predictive rules that we'll talk about and how those were formulated. Um, so it, this is also a, a resource for you. I can't obviously go through all of the clinical predictive rules in, an, in a matter of an hour. So this is a, a resource for you to go in and find on your own. So the ACR, which is the American College of Radiology, puts out a publication regarding uh, criteria regarding diagnostic imaging. So they publish this uh, usually every year, uh, maybe some updates once in a while. Uh, but ultimately, the document is really uh, helping you determine what the appropriate imaging modality is for a particular condition or some findings that you may have come across in your own practice. So uh, go to their website, have a look at this, and you can determine its utility. And there's a couple other ways of doing this, which I'll talk about as well. So let's jump into thinking about our tissue types. So plain film, I'll talk a little bit about plain film, and we'll do it in a way that we look at some cases. Uh, we'll talk about some CT imaging, MRI, diagnostic ultrasound, and a little bit of uh, radionuclei imaging, or as we think of it as bone scans, which is typically what we're going to be using when it comes to MSK imaging. So, tissue types. So I blacked out this section for us, just so we can talk a little bit about it. In fact, I've got a little write-up on this particular individual uh, as we get there. But when you think of plain film, imagining you're thinking of its limitations, but what is it that we do actually see when we, when we look at a, at a plain film? So clearly, we see osseous anatomy and its variations to normal anatomy. You guys have all taken some bone pathology classes, and you know some of the osseous anatomy, obviously, and some of its variations. We also look for uh, common patterns of pathology, 
And this is really designed around our knowledge of mechanisms of injury. So can somebody give me an example of a mechanism of injury that we would then ultimately see on a playing film as, as we would imagine if the injury is, is got to the point where it's injured bone? Somebody think of something. Right. Yeah, like, so what mechanism of injury? Foosh. A foosh. So a fall on a stressed hand, and then they typically have what kind of pain associated with it? So a wrist hand pain, and if we are thinking of a particular fracture, we might think of scaphoid, scaphoid fracture. So then we have anatomical snuff box pain, and we've got that particular history. Now we've got a predictive pattern of mechanism of injury, and then of course that would drive our decision making regarding a plain film exam, right? Makes some sense. In fact, I may have an example of just that today. So this particular patient um, is a runner. Can anybody uh, have a look at the plain film? And I've blocked out a section for us because the answers are the subsequent images that you can see here. So this is tough. tough. If you're not looking at film on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, then these findings can be very, very subtle. But this is a runner with hip pain. So driving the decision-making process regarding imaging, we would then first think of conservative care, right? If we've got a runner, Differential diagnose runner with, with what guys? Think of differential diagnosis, runner hip pain, and then how we drive our decision making process for getting diagnostic imaging. Somebody tell me. Stress fracture. Stress fracture. Okay, stress fracture of the hip. Yeah. Yeah. From the last type of impingement syndrome, typically not seen with runners, of course, unless they're in the age population, unless there's some morphological variation to the anatomy. So maybe some soft tissue injuries that we would not see here on plain film. But what would then be the signs and symptoms associated with something like a stress fracture? That maybe get us thinking in that direction. Stress fracture. Symptoms worse with activity. Okay, worse with activity. Weight bearing. Weight bearing. Pain is, uh, is kind of always a little there, but never goes away completely. And then of course, if you've treated the patient with, with some uh, conservative treatments that are associated with soft, injury, soft tissue injuries like bursitis and the pain still continues to, uh, to evolve uh, that you think of imaging. Now, of course, uh, if you're thinking of soft tissue injuries, you would be thinking of plain film. This particular one was in fact a stress fracture. Can anybody see the stress fracture? Yeah, so I'll point it out. It's right in here. In fact, if you uh, close your eyes slightly, you can see it better. Uh, it's in fact right here. So let's let's pull the. So here it is. So here's our stress fracture. So this particular individual did in fact have a, a, a stress fracture associated with just repetitive trauma. What other repetitive trauma type injuries do we think of when we think of stress fractures? What locations? For the runner. Well, shin. Shins. Shins. Yeah. Even maybe feet, or the tarsals, are common locations, especially if they've changed footwear or they're new to the sport and they're maybe putting too many more or too too many miles on and, and they're not really prepped for it. So let's really look at these uh, MRs for a second and just to kind of get you back up to speed on what the MR is providing. So this is a T1 and T2 weighted sequence. So the T1 and T2 weighted sequence allow us to really uh, first look at anatomy and then look for water density on the, on the second image, right? Anatomy T1, think of anatomy for T1. And T2, think, for, think of water. You can see that the anatomy is a little bit easier to see on the T1 sequence as, it, as the T2 sequence gets a little blurry. So this is a direct sign, although it is very subtle. So let's look at something else. This is a fall on an outstretched hand, but the pain isn't here at the wrist. Instead, it's out of the elbow. So the first image, of course, is the uh, image that was provided along with a frontal projection. I didn't provide you the frontal projection, but it did not reveal the fracture until uh, the different angle was taken on the second image. But the first image does have an indirect sign of the fracture. Can anybody see the indirect sign? Go ahead, Dr. Smith. Anybody else? Somebody else? Yeah, the fat tissue. Yeah, the fat tissue, the fat plane. So the first image, we had a nice direct finding, which was subtle, but the second image here, or the second case, has an indirect finding associated with this particular fracture. So fat pad displacement. The anterior fat pad, also known as the sail sign, is, is, uh, is often misused. It is quite commonly seen, even without a fracture. 
but that posterior fat pack movement is unusual and has to drive you to thinking that there is a fracture. So then a more aggressive search, ultimately in this particular case, made them take a, a different uh, angle on the patient's elbow, an unusual angle for the second image. Anybody seen one of these before? Yeah. Does anybody remember the name of the fracture in this particular case? So boards are coming up, students. This is called a chisel fracture. So often difficult to see. Point tenderness across the uh, the elbow. Typically, when you when you palpate, you direct pressure onto the uh, radial head, and the patient will come off the table. All right, Melissa. This is the patient with that fall on outstretched hand. So we don't have a direct sign here radiographically, but we have that history that Melissa indicated that fall on outstretched hand, and then that point tenderness across the across the, uh, the area of the at top of the stuff box again, right below it is the scaphoid. So in this particular case, we don't see it until we do an additional image. Can somebody remember what that additional image might be to help us? Yeah, but, yeah so what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> ulnar variation or ulnar, uh, ulnar stressing, right? So then again, that subtle fracture line becomes uh, more obvious. So let's just talk really briefly about this case for a second. This is actually a very serious case. Why is this such a serious case? Because it doesn't seem like such a serious case. A tiny little fracture across this person's scaffold. Why is it such a serious case? Yeah, avascular process. Can somebody remember the anatomy here that causes this problem in this particular fracture? Blood What's the, the blood supply, of course. What is the unique uh, characteristics of this particular bone and its blood supply? It like only feeds to one side. Go ahead. It like only feeds to one side. Yeah, so the, the blood supply goes past the bone, if you remember this, and enters kind of the distal pole of the scaphoid and then, of course, feeds it proximally. So a fracture at the waist of the scaphoid often results in avascular necrosis of the proximal pole of the, of the scaphoid. Problematic for a patient that, uh, that doesn't have good approximation and, of course, poor blood supply in this case. So pinning this is not an unusual occurrence if the patient uh, does, in fact, uh, show signs of avascular necrosis. How would I determine that avascular necrosis is occurring here? I mean, this is one of those cases where you really need to be paying close attention to this patient. So advanced imaging for sure. MRI would be very, very helpful, and maybe even something else that would show perfusion. Right? So we're back to the nuclear imaging piece. So we'll chat a little bit more about that. So before I go on to that one, plain film. What do we know? It has, uh, well, well, let's talk about in the terms of sensitivity and specificity for a minute, because we're going to do the same thing with our CT image that's coming up next. Sensitivity and specificity. What do those terms mean to you? So if, if we're thinking of fractures, uh, is the uh, plain film a, a great imaging modality to detect fractures? It kind of depends, but if it's there, it's going to show up, right? Especially if you know what kind of imaging sequence, imaging sequence is, the, is the best, or imaging positions like this particular one is the best. So great for fractures, yes? Sure, pretty good. Soft tissue? Yeah, not so good for soft tissues, unless of course, again, predictable soft tissue planes can be identified, like our posterior fat pad sign on our, on our elbow. What about bone loss in general, like osteopenia? Because we can have things like, uh, well, in an athlete who falls on an outstretched hand, like this particular case, and months later continues to have wrist pain and in fact after a lengthy time off of their sport the pain continues and in fact starts to migrate to the opposite side has anybody heard this pattern of of, uh, of pain distribution after a single fall reflex sympathetic dystrophy or pseudox atrophy if any, you guys remember this from your classes at all? it's one of those things that you barely ever see but it's talked about often in literature so uh, osteopenia, localized osteopenia will occur in this particular case, but how much bone loss actually has to take place before we get to see it on a plain film? Yeah, some say 50% bone loss before you get to see it. 
So that's a disuse like osteopenia, this particular one, pseudex atrophy, has got both neurologic complaints or neurologic compromise as well as vascular compromise. They don't really understand it very well, but bone loss occurs nonetheless. All right, CT. So plain film, really great imaging for so obvious fractures in, in easy places to image. When we're, when we're looking to image our athlete using computerized tomography, we're thinking of complex pieces of anatomy. Osseous anatomy that is difficult to image on a plain film, which is again the reason why we're looking at CT. It obviously has some limitations to soft tissue anatomy as well, but much better, obviously, than the plain film that we were looking at. So if you're thinking that the athlete has a soft tissue injury, this is a consideration. Okay. Maybe a consideration. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then, of course, spatial resolution here is, is phenomenal. Probably the best spatial resolution imaging modality we can, we can uh, employ uh, when it comes to imaging the patient. And then what are Hounsfield units? Hounsfield units. This is the attenuation value measured in Hounsfield units. So attenuation value, just like an x-ray, we're attenuating, uh, attenuating x-rays, the soft tissues are attenuating, the bone is attenuating at different values. So Hounsfield units are just the values associated with the attenuation of the x-ray, and that's of course relative to the tissue that it's, that it's uh, hitting, right? So you can see here, I would consider this, well, let's talk about that for a second. Bone windows versus soft tissue windows. You guys remember hearing this before? So bone windows obviously allow us to see bone more exquisitely. And in particular, we're looking to see the difference between medullary space and cortex. Soft tissue windows, again, allow us to see uh, delineation of tissue between, uh, between densities. So fat, as you can see here, versus muscle. And water, they all have a little bit different Attenuation values, let's describe as Hounsfield units. We can do some windowing and we can do some leveling out, more complex than we need to talk about today. So let's take a look at this case. They don't often come with an arrow, so you have to remember that. Right? In this particular case, there's a beautiful arrow here showing us, well, what is it showing us? Posterior acetabular fracture, right? Posterior rib of the acetabulum has been fractured in this particular case. So how do you get to that place? Posterior acetabular fracture. So what's the mechanism of injury? Because really, we talked about mechanism of injury and using it to predict what was going to happen on that plane film. What's the mechanism of injury here? This is not an easy one to have happen, I can tell you. This is a difficult fracture to occur. Car accident. Yeah, this is pretty traumatic stuff. Car accident type of injury. So a posterior acetabular rib fracture, if you think of the mechanism of injury, and it's a car accident, the patient is sitting in their car with their hips obviously flexed, then their knee has been struck and it drives the femur head posteriorly into the acetabulum. Of course, this is what's happened in this particular case. Or has it? But that's maybe at least some thought process, right, on this one. So let's look at this particular case. And I've got a bunch of images here. And we'll look at them separately. So the plain film, as you can see, it labeled uh, A and it's on the far left of your screen was completely normal, at least from this particular uh, radiologist's perspective, and I looked hard to see it. Often that's what happens, is we find something in advanced imaging and we go back to the plane film and see, did we miss it? So let me give you a little history on this individual. This is a 20-year-old collegiate football player, lineman. He was blocking during practice, and when he was forced from his left side over an extended right leg, it created a bunch of internal rotation and abduction, obviously of the hip, and he felt sliding and a crunching, crunching, crunching sensation as he was driven over his right hip. So this wasn't a car accident, this was sport related. So he had pain immediately, dropped to the, to the ground, more so couldn't stand up, couldn't wait back. Was sent to the emergency room and the plane fell was taken. And they could see nothing. Pain was still there and continued to to not be able to put weight on his hip, and the MR was taken next, of course, and the decision-making process was the plain film, didn't see anything, so it's gotta be a soft tissue abnormality, so the soft tissue abnormality did not uh, show up, was not detected, but the osseous abnormality was detected. If you look at image B on the far right, you can actually see this water-weighted sequence allows us to see fluid dissecting through the area of fracture, fracture line. 
can see it there. Big arrow, again, typically doesn't come with the arrows. So three months later, the patient was imaged again. And this is the lowest uh, images you can see on this particular, uh, particular overhead. You can see the T2 weighted sequence again, water, if you recall, T2. You can see an awful lot of fluid inside of the femoral head now. And you can see that same amount of fluid in the femoral head on the T1 weighted sequence, which displaces the normal uh, brighter signal of fat in the medullary space on that second image. You guys see that? So why would the femoral head not have a bunch of fluid in it? Because it really wasn't the femoral head injury, it was the acetabular injury. And three months now has gone by and there's still all sorts of inflammation in here. So acetabular injury creates a dysfunctional joint. The actual joint surface has been disrupted and now there's literally dysfunctioning between, dysfunction between the acetabulum and the femoral head during movement. Concerning, when you have a fracture through a joint, this is now a serious condition. And now you're concerned about, well, what are you concerned about? As this progresses, what's the next phase of, of this patient? Degeneration. Degeneration, right? Now you've got joint dysfunction, degeneration will ensue. Just like that scaphoid fracture, although complicated by avascular necrosis, that's also a joint and requires serious um, consideration for surgical intervention in this particular case as well. One more image here. This is 10 months after the patient's initial injury. Now we're seeing almost all of the fluid uh, leaving the, the humoral head. Sorry, the humoral head. But, uh, 10 months after. So let's talk about pain for a second. This patient had pain, although eventually was able to weight bear, and they, did, and they opted to not have surgery. That was a consideration. Um, that fluid sticks around for a really long time. So let's relate that to pain, because this is really inflammation, and of course the, the, the chemical mediators associated with pain are sitting around when you have inflammation inside the medullary space or outside of it for that matter. So pain had been there for almost the entire 10 months, and that fluid sitting in there is a good predictor for pain. Questions on this? Interesting case. Yeah. What kind of treatment plan did involved? So this one was conservative care. There wasn't any displacement of the bony fragment in this particular case. So uh, crutches for, I think the first, I think there was first three months. Yeah, crutches. Typical bone healing takes place in how long? Six to eight weeks is typical bone healing. When it's when it sits up against the joint and there's fluid bathing in this particular area, it can be very difficult and can have a protracted period of time for healing. Right? Much more difficult to predict the healing speed in this particular case. And this is intra intracapsular, almost intracapsular, right? So. so if you would have done some kind of surgical management, yep. just a pin? There would be a pin in this particular case. So let's talk a little bit about uh, CT and MR as they uh, are often used uh, interchangeably often, uh, depending of course on the condition of the patient. What are some of the reasons why you would choose a CT over an MRI? Because we'll talk about MRI in a second. Cheaper. Cheaper? Speed. Speed. Patient comfortability. Okay, so patient comfort. There's a couple others in here. Of course the uh, the imaging of the tissue in particular has got to be part of the decision making process. What is it we're actually going to be looking for? Metal. One more time? Metal. Yeah, so for instance, in this last case, if this patient had a pin in their femoral head and now had an additional injury, uh, we have what's described as blooming artifacts on the, on the MRI. So we may have a, a poorly imaged hip because of the the artifact process around that piece of metal inside the hip, and we could then have to move over to CT scans, which are not uh, are not uh, uncomplicated by by metal as well, but potentially see it a little bit easier. So, of course, in the emergency room, and you've got uh, somebody hooked up to a, uh, a resuscitator, uh, they're not bringing that person into the MR as well. So, anything that's metal, of course, has to be removed, as you know. What other things might uh, be your uh, your choice between MR versus CT. Non-radiation at CT, but yeah. 
Yeah. So what's the number? This is how this is um, rads, right? Rads of exposure to radiation. So there is a we describe it as stochastic and non-stochastic effects, but that goes far down the path of understanding why we are choosing MR over CT in this particular case. Uh, the reality is you have to limit your number of rads exposed uh, to a patient. So a good example of somebody is going through um, evaluation of like lung cancer or removal of cancer, and they're going to they're going to image the patient over and over again. Uh, then often they will do a bunch of serial CT scans and x-rays as they're monitoring the patient. Uh, that would then be a, be a good reason to maybe change modalities at some point. All right, let's move on to uh, MR. So again, if we're thinking of imaging the athlete, we've got limited uh, capacity to image the osseous structures. Of course, unless we're looking for something in particular, great uh, imaging modality for soft tissue structures, of course. Um, spatial resolution, again, fantastic. And really what we're looking for here now, and the reason we're doing MR, is uh, to look to see if there's any injury, right? Any water or inflammation associated with the patient's condition. So water equals edema, you guys recall that. And then we've briefly talked about T1 and T2. There's fat saturation and there's gadolinium enhancing images. So lots of stuff to remember. You guys are probably remembering some of these things. Let's get into the case. So, I have a little story of this particular individual. He's a 16-year-old, nationally ranked tennis player. Uh, plans to play Division One as he uh, heads to college. So he has uh, been playing by left-sided back pain for about six months. The pain is directly related to the number of uh, of sets he he, uh, he participates in, specifically as he's uh, aggressively serving. But as soon as he walks away from the tennis court and he does cross training or he does uh, any other activity outside of tennis, he has no pain. So this is our image. Why do we choose MR in this particular case? He actively participates in other sports without any issue whatsoever. Tennis is a problem. Interesting. So this is kind of predictable, actually, if you know the mechanics of tennis in particular as you get later in your set or your match, there's something that you're doing more often. Anybody? I'll start, do you want to jump in? Yeah. What, what's the question? So what, what uh, and, uh, I love challenging each other, right? this is good sure. stuff. So, so as this particular individual progresses in his matches, he gets more and more back pain. And Matt, jump in at any time too. Dr. Moose, please. So he is pain-free during any other activity, any other sporting activity, except for tennis. And what is that thing that he's doing over and over again as the match progresses? Rotating, accelerating, decelerating, keep, keep expanding on the yeah, so it's the extension piece, right? Dr. Tuck, Dr. Stark mentioned it. Uh, so the extension piece. So particularly serving, right? Aggressive overhead serving. All right, so this can be translated to other sports too, with young men and women that are getting back pain as they continue to do some type of repetitive movement. So let's look at the image. We can figure this one out. We chose MR because, well, we're looking for edema in this particular case. We're not looking for a fracture. Right? We're not looking for some type of osseous or, or dysfunctional joint because all of the other activities seemingly are pain free. So we're looking for edema here. Can we see the edema? Or could we say we're looking for a pre-fracture? Or a pre-fracture. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys aren't experts on MR reading, that's okay. But you should recognize the mechanics of what's happening and say ding ding ding. I'm thinking of a pre-fracture here. This is a stress response, and we can actually see the pedicle of the lowest segment, or the, almost the lowest segment, right here. There's an awful lot of fluid collection in this pedicle, and leading a little bit into the pars. We think more of a pars fracture in a case where you're doing repetitive extension, but this particular case, it was actually in the pedicle. But this could have easily been the pars. All right, let's talk about the athlete coming to you, 
and having this particular scenario, and you image them and you confirm that there is in fact edema inside of the pedicle or the pars, what do you do? Cross training is not painful, right? Like any stress response, the answer is stop doing that, right? <laughs> so, of course, the athlete who is headed to Division One uh, NCAA or Division One tennis is going to say what to you? Mm-hmm. No, I'm going to keep doing that. The same with the uh, the high end uh, football player who's hitting uh, his alignment and is you know getting into that that extended position, stressing his his back, or the or the Olympic gymnast who is doing the same thing, right? So what's what's your what's your decision making and management process for this particular individual? So stop doing that is probably not going to happen, but it is the right thing to do, especially if it's the the weekend warrior who is getting themselves in this kind of a predicament. What's what's the what is it that we need to do? So manage inflammation, of course, is part of it. Uh, but this really then becomes about uh, supporting the spine properly with adding activities that are really designed around core stability. So, so there's a lot of discussion about just creating a really good core, core, stable core for these individuals to ensure that this no longer becomes a problem. The mechanics like have to be changed a little bit, but stopping the activity is it's difficult for these folks. So I'm a big fan of uh, of Kelly Starrett. You guys know who Kelly Starrett is. He does a lot of uh, discussion around organizing your spine during uh, during particular activities or movements, being aware of where your spine is and engaging your abdomen properly. So, so it's a good way of thinking about it. All right, let's look at, uh, at the images from a different a different angle. You can see the axial sequence here again provides us with a good example of the amount of inflammation sitting inside that pars slash pedicle area. Yes. How sure are we at this point? that we just have bone edema pre-stress and there's not actual fracture? So, it's a good question. Um, so that, you, that will help me determine my prognosis for the patient, whether we've got two months out of no stress or six months out. There's an actual stress fracture. It takes a long time. Uh, the is going to take a long time, many, many months yep. of no tennis, or at least no serving. So I, I think the other imaging modality to choose here, because of the complex anatomy and the location of this, would be CT to see if there is really truly any kind of uh, uh, any signs of, of fracture occurring. But the MRI is, for me, is telling me enough that this has to has to stop now. So from a treatment perspective, it's 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 not about to happen, but it's difficult to predict when. Um, but it could happen at any moment too. So it's difficult to predict when the fracture is occurring in this particular individual. All right, we can keep moving. So here's another good example. And so the knee is a really great discussion, easy topic to discuss. So let's talk about mechanisms of injury here, predictable soft tissue injury. So let's, let's really briefly talk about that. And then we'll talk about this individual, and then we'll look at the MR and see if we've predicted our, our, our pattern of injury. So first of all, let's talk about the, just the mechanisms of injury in the knee. So Medial gapping, lateral gapping, right? Or valgus or varus stresses, makes some sense. And of course, the corresponding tissue would be either the medial or lateral collateral ligaments. Anterior and posterior drawer type of movements, or tibias push posteriorly, of course, or tibias pulled anteriorly. This, of course, puts the anterior and the posterior cruciate ligaments uh, in jeopardy. Often these things are combined, they're not single actions. So, this particular individual, has, I'll say the area of pain, and you can tell me what the mechanism of injury was. Almost pure lateral knee pain after an injury that has a mechanism associated with it that now you should be able to predict. This is a, a little bit of an unusual pattern if it's lateral knee pain, right? So what was the mechanism of injury if it's pure lateral knee pain? So is it valgus or is it varus? Uh, it's varus, right? So lateral knee pain, for an athlete to get lateral knee pain from a valgus or varus stress, uh, stress right? This is, it's gonna have to be a varus stress. So maybe 
the trauma was on the inside of the knee and pressing laterally and gapping the lateral joint space. So then, of course, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about the lateral to lateral ligament injury. What about the meniscus when it comes to these kind of injuries? When there's a gapping, is the lateral meniscus in, in, in jeopardy here? Not so much. What about the other way around, the medial side gaps? Yeah. So something else to remember, on the lateral aspect of the knee, there is a very loose connection between the capsule of the lateral cloud ligament and the meniscus. Loose connection here. On the medial side, however, if it's an opposite action, there is a much stronger connection between the capsule and the meniscus. So often, even in a gapping situation on the medial side, the meniscus gets involved purely because of meniscal capsular attachments. Not so much on the lateral side. So let's look at our MR. So this is the anatomy of injury damage, T1. So we're going to look at the anatomy here and see if we can find it. So if you go off to this medial side, take a look at the medial collateral ligament, and then we can compare it to that lateral side where we think we have our injury. And the fibula's not in here, so I'll tell you which is medial, which is lateral. So here's our medial collateral ligament. Okay, we can see it, we can follow it. And depending on your slice and where you are inside of the anatomy, you may not get the whole image. Take a look at the lateral side, all of a sudden we see kind of some disruption and some tissue. Difficulty to see the entirety of the collateral ligament here. That could be just sequence and acquisition of the, issue of the image but it's questionable. What else do you see here? This thing is a little bit more difficult, and again, the more you look at these things, the more likely it's going to help. But predicting, again, what we should be looking at, mechanism of injury is really how we should be thinking of this, and then trying to predict what it is that we should be seeing. Difficult, though, it's, it's difficult. So see these striations, these are these could be thought of as just chunks of bone, a little bit more, more dense bone in this particular area. We can see it above too. We call them physeal scars or just the trabecular pattern. But we also have to consider the mechanism of injury and concern about a tibial plateau fracture or at least stressing of the tibial plateau. So in fact, when we look at the T2 weighted sequence, we see all sorts of edema on that lateral aspect of this patient's knee. And we also see there is some, some fluid within the medullary space. Lots of pain associated with bone marrow edema, folks. Tons of pain there. Typically, uh, the, the x-ray doesn't show it nearly as well as the MR, obviously. Grades one, two, three for ligament injuries. Does anybody remember this? Yes? Grade one. Some pain, but is the ligament intact or not intact? Ligament's intact, right? Grade two, we have some partial tearing of the ligament. Lots and lots of pain. Pain gets worse. Lots of inflammation when we start tearing this tissue. In fact, this is the worst pain when it comes to ligament injuries. Okay, grade one, yeah, it's, it's sore, but the integrity of the tissue is, is still intact. But grade two, we are losing tissue integrity and lots and lots of pain. What happens with three? It's gotta be way worse, right? No, in fact, pain goes away. And then we have all sorts of deformity when it comes to moving the joint around. There's lots of gapping, but the pain is almost gone. So a great way to predict the severity of the ligamentous injury. And of course, that's when you're doing a physical examination of the patient. All right. This is a 30-year-old, uh, 32-year-old, injured, playing softball, weekend warrior, goes sliding into uh, second base and tags it without getting hit, gets, gets to the second base, uh, but comes up hobbling because of his uh, aggressive slide into second base. Plain film was uh, done immediately as they brought him into the emergency room. So of course, if you're sliding in and you do a, a nasty inversion or eversion injury to your ankle, and you can't walk, that is uh, Ottawa ankle rules, right? Clinical predictive rule, if you will. And this particular individual couldn't. So what do you do? Well, you take an x-ray. At least you start with an x-ray, but you see nothing in this particular case. 
but that nasty inversion injury may not have produced a fracture, could have, didn't, in this particular case, at least on the plain field. So the patient was sent to MR. And you can see in this particular case, there is uh, quite a, an injury to the talus. In fact, you've split the talus in two. Not seen on the x-ray at all. But even if you are thinking of a fracture, and the clinical predictive rule should tell us that there's a fracture there, and you don't see one, as a clinician, maybe it's time to employ a different imaging modality to, to, to identify if there is, in fact, a injury to the bone that is just simply not detected on the plane field. Just like our elbow, in this particular case, it's the ankle. Yes, sir. Do you, predictability, do you send for safety right away, or are you doing some sort of so it's a two-week trial? It's, it's a great question. So if you're in your office, and you've got the imaging modality at your disposal, then do an x-ray. And even if you didn't see something, but you're certain that there should be a fracture there, I think, uh, well, here's, it's a good question because an MR immediately would show us very little bone marrow edema. It would take us at least two or three days to really get a, a lot of bone marrow edema in this particular area to see it. Um, so that's your question, is how long do you wait? Uh, I think a, a couple of day wait on the MR is, is absolutely appropriate, but of course, this person is not able to stand. So they're... We're not going anywhere. Your treatment is likely not going to, not going to, uh, not going to change anything over the next couple of days. And knowing that the MR is going to take a couple of days to really show us the bone marrow edema, yeah, a couple of day waits not a bad idea. CT would of course show right away. Right. So would you say CT is being cheaper and for acute? So it's a good question, right? So what do we do with this? So if we're thinking that there's soft tissue injuries involved as well, then I'm going to wait for the MR. It's going to show me both. It is cheaper though to go CT, but again, I'm, I'm using MR in this particular case because I get the ancillary benefit of seeing the soft tissues at a, at a, at a much uh, much more obvious rate. Again, lots of bone marrow in this particular case. All right, let's talk about diagnostic ultrasound for uh, just a couple of seconds here. Um, it is a, an interesting modality, and it is becoming uh, more and more uh, used inside of the uh, inside of the MSK uh, practice and, and used around the athlete. So, what do you guys know about diagnostic ultrasound? Obviously, it's good for muscles, right? We can look at muscle tissue, we can look at uh, ligaments, and we can look at cartilage. We, of course, detect fluid with these particular scans. And really, what's neat in coming into vogue is dynamic imaging, where the patient is actually moving their joint and being imaged at the exact same time to see what the relationship is of the tendons with the joint and if there's, in fact, any dysfunction occurring with the soft tissues as the joint moves. Pretty interesting stuff. There is lots of limitations. What's the obvious limitation to ultrasound? So the depth of field view. We can't get very deep at this point, right? That's the obvious limitation. So muscles, ligaments, cartilage, detecting fluid, and I know about this much about this imaging modality as it continues to evolve. So I have a case here in front of us. Let's talk briefly about this one. I'll get the right information for us here. 24 year old competitive cyclist presents to your clinic the complaint of right anterior thigh pain. You can see that in fact the image tells us that this is a rectus femoris muscle. So he didn't injure himself cycling though. He was. Uh, he was outside playing soccer and kicked a ball really hard and felt something ripped, the superior aspect of rectus femoris in this particular case. It was so bad that he stopped playing completely, palpated his leg, feel like ripping sensation, and then actually felt the defect in the muscle right immediately. Lots of swelling and bleeding into the area occurred within days. So, being the 24, stubborn, 24-year-old male athlete, didn't go and see anybody about it. Rested. Let it just kind of heal on its own. So knowing that he didn't see anybody about it, what do you think happened to this tissue? Say again? 
Well, that's a good, it's a good thought. You would expect something pretty traumatic to happen or dramatic to happen. So he did get mouse out of civic ambulance, but he did get an awful lot of scarring in the area. Lots and lots of scarring. So that's what we see on this image. So this particular uh, area encircled is the, is the disorganization of the muscular fibers here. You can see there's a lot of uh, what we describe as uh, hypoechoic area. We see lots of white in this particular area. Not giving us the right muscular architecture back on this image. So this is a really interesting case because uh, he waited a year before he got treatment. Yeah, a year. And guess what the treatment was though? This is really cool. Grasting. Yeah. So he went in and did a bunch of grasting to this area, uh, and the reason he got treatment a year after was because he was cycling and felt it just wasn't functioning the way it should. Muscle wasn't moving the way it should, wasn't contracting the way it should. And it took him a year to figure out that he needed to go do something about it, even after palpating the defect. So, the second image, you can still see a little bit of the architecture of the muscle is disrupted, uh, but uh, much better, much more consistent across the muscle belly in the sense of its architecture. Less scarring, grasping. Good, uh, good technique for this particular individual, did a good job of getting them back to the competitive place that they once were. Okay, so nuclear imaging. Let's talk about this really briefly too. We've only got a few minutes left. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about predictive rules with you for just a second. I have far more material to talk, talk about than an hour or something. So um, nuclear imaging, bone scan in particular, let's let's briefly remember what this is going to be used for. What do we use it for? So detection of bone turnover. Right? Osteoblastic activity or maybe a lack of bone turn turnover. So we not only get hot spots on our image, which tells us there's an increased activity, we can also look at the areas that aren't getting as much activity and we can determine these are cold spots. So what do we use bone scans for in the sense of the athlete? We talked about this earlier. Stress fracture. Stress fracture, right? Absolutely, stress fracture. So let's look. Stress fractures. Also, osteochondral injuries. Possibly identifying a, a bone a tumor, of course. We have uh, osteonecrosis infection, RSDS we mentioned briefly earlier. Diagnostic bone, uh, sorry, uh, diagnosing bone infections. And of course, DJD. Again, sensitivity specificity discussion. This is really why are you going to use this image? Well, if, it, uh, if it's a stress fracture, I'm not gonna see it on an x-ray, likely, unless it's fairly advanced. I will see it on a bone scan. Makes some sense in this particular case. We have a stress fracture in a person's uh, tarsal. Sensitivity versus specificity, not very specific. So we have something going on in the metatarsal, we just don't know exactly what it is. Of course, our history and clinical findings will tell us what it is. Right? With these two pieces of information, together we can predict what it is. Let's look at this one for a second. You guys are Bone scan is not, it's, it's complicated, complicated by many things. This particular patient has Paget's disease, seen specifically around the pelvis. So we have a lot of uh, radiopharmaceutical uptake in the area of bone turnover, as you would expect, that's what the bone scan is designed to do. So we see a lot of that in the pelvis. We also see a bunch of rib fractures. We see a little bit of, uh, of background noise in the osseous skeleton. And then we see the radionuclei, the pharmaceutical being uh, processed through the patient's kidneys, so we see the kidneys quite well. This person also has a heart condition, and they have pericarditis. So we can see all sorts of interesting hot spots in the area. Again, sensitivity versus specificity. We wouldn't know any of these things unless we took x-rays, right, it was a, in combination. But an x-ray, again, has got some limitations. So the new imaging modality is to fuse not just an X-ray but a CT together with our nuclear imaging. We call this, well, what do we call this? Spec or PET CT. Okay. So positron emission tomography plus CT fusion. So in this particular case, we see uh, the CT scan on the upper image fused with the nuclear information, nuclear imaging information. And now we have this incredible sensitive image telling us that there's bone turnover. And then we have the 
CT that has this exquisite spatial resolution allowing us to really predict what's going on with the OSIS structure. In this particular case, the concern when they did the CT alone was that there was an infection there. But they find out later on that there isn't an infection with the, the bone scan, but there's an awful lot of bone turnover, and they find out that this is just degenerative changes in this particular case. All right, so a review of some of the common uh, imaging modalities used, and again, when we're thinking of the athlete, we're really thinking of what is the tissue we're trying to image, and we're again predicting the tissue injury based on the patient's history findings. But there are clinical predictive rules. The ACR does publish a document that describes this particular idea of clinical predictive rules. Right? Like, when to take an x-ray of the cervical spine. Well, when is that? Or when to take an x-ray of the hip. What are, we gonna, what are we likely going to see in this particular scenario if the patient fits all these particular criteria? It's difficult to read all of the, as all of the ACR document. It literally is 100 plus pages. So common sense is more likely the best use of, uh, of that particular uh, thought process. So there are some clinical predictive rules and the criteria. So who cares, really, is what I say about this. So this is the way I think. The ACR document is a reference point if you're, if you're stuck. The reality is the common sense rule is if you're going to order an image, it should be based whether or not it's, your finding is going to change management. Is your finding going to change the way in which you manage this patient? So here is a good example. I'm, uh, I'm up in Canada a week ago, and I dive into a lake. And I'm 44 years old, so apparently diving into a lake is a dangerous thing for a 44-year-old. I hurt my shoulder. I literally hurt my shoulder. I come out of the water, and like, really? I dove into the lake, and I hurt my shoulder. And it gets to the point where I can't move my shoulder properly. So it's painful to the point where I'm headed to the ER, get some help with a pain management piece. And the ER doctor uses, uses this rule, whether she's going to x-ray me or not. She says, um, I can x-ray you, but my management at this point is going to be the same whether I x-ray you or I don't x-ray you. I don't think you've broken something. It didn't sound like you had a trauma that would have caused a fracture, and the x-ray is going to detect fracture. So my management process, or her management process was to deal with the pain. Do I get an x-ray? No. Should I get an MR? Maybe. Depends if my pain continues and my management is not successful. My pain management has been successful. Do I need an MR? I'll, I'll, look at, I'll, I'll ask you that in a second. So I'm going to run through the auto ankle rules for just a second and then let's talk about my shoulder for a minute. Auto ankle rules. This is a good one. Everybody remembers this one, right? So pain near the medium malleolus and at least one of the following should be there before you decide to image the patient. So imaging is typical if you have uh, the inability to weight bear immediately and the ability to take four steps, right? You guys remember this? And then tenderness anywhere along the distal six centimeters of the, of the, uh, of the malleolus, either side. You guys remember this? Otherwise, it's typical you're not going to find any fractures. If the patient can, can walk a few steps, likely not, uh, not fractured. If the patient can't weight bear at all, maybe, and then you shoot the x-ray. Weber classification, and then of course some of the mechanisms of injury. In this particular case, this is a nasty ankle inversion injury. You guys remember where else to look? Yeah, at the top end. So lots of ligamentous injury. You can see tons of swelling here. But also remember, these are fraught with the complication of the, of the ring structure, which is the fibula and the tibia together. You have to watch at the top end of the, of the knee whether or not there is a fracture above it. So I'm going to scoot through and talk a little bit about subacromial impingement syndrome just because I think that's what I've created for myself. <clears throat> so, 
predictor variables on whether or not I should get an MR. So Hawkins Kennedy, what is this test? Does anybody remember? So I get into this position and I look to see if I can squeeze it, do it again, and then I really squeeze it hard and I feel pain there, folks. A little bit. Okay. Not tremendous pain, but it's painful. I have videos, you guys remember these. Painful arm, what's the painful arm? What does this one look like? So I'm gonna do it on my good side. So a painful arc, right? Where is the pain occurring? Is there pain anywhere along this? And then of course, what, what angle is the pain actually occurring may help determine whether or not I'm actually creating an impingement, right? You guys remember this? You guys remember the numbers? Yes? When I hit 60 degrees and above, right, is when I know I'm really squeezing the supraspinatus, right? If it's definitely painful in that area, Probably a good predictor for impingement syndrome. Pain and weakness on external rotation as well is a good predictor that I've injured or I've created some impingement in this particular case. So if all three of those are creating pain, then it is a positive predictor for an impingement syndrome. So what is impingement syndrome? If I took an x-ray, would I see something? Possibly, what might it be? Yeah, a chromiohumoral interspace is reduced. It should be between 7 and 11. If it's reduced, 7 to 11 is the normal numbers. If it's reduced smaller than that, the humerus is elevated, right? And now I have a smaller space for the supraspinatus tendon to slide in and out of there. And that's, again, a good positive finding for an impingement syndrome. What causes impingement syndrome? A chromial deformity. So we have different types of acromion processes. If, uh, if it's a type 3, which is a hooked acromion, then that's an anatomical variation to anatomy that is going to cause an external impingement of the supraspinatus tendon. AC joint DJD is another good example of causing an impingement syndrome. If I've actually injured my rotator cuff, supraspinatus, and it's weak, it can cause the elevation of the humerus and again cause an impingement syndrome. Or if I'm a throwing athlete and I have weakened the anterior capsule of my shoulder and now again the same thing occurs, the humerus elevates a little bit because of that weakened capsule, then I can create an impingement syndrome. Throwing athletes are fraught with this particular complication. Three predictors. Again, impingement syndrome, supraspinatus is getting squeezed underneath the acromion process, or a degenerative joint, or a weakened capsule elevating the humerus. You can see the bursa is often uh, first to start being irritated, of course. Here's a nice example of a normal acromion, and then if you end up with a hooked or a spur or DJD in the area of the AC joint or the acromion itself, you can again lose the amount of space needed for the supersized tendon to slide in and out of this particular area. Again, impingement syndrome. And the consequences of this second image, the acromion spur, or any type of impingement is going to what? It's going to be super spinatus disruption completely. And then you can add the drop arm test to your, to your orthopedic evaluation if the positive drop arm exists. Again, a good positive indicator that you've got a complete tear or at least a partial tear of the supraspinatus. And then if we were going to look at it from an imaging perspective, we would look to see if there is a disruption or if there's any type of finding within the tendon itself or the underlying bony anatomy. In this particular case, we see that there is fluid within the medullary space and the insertion point of the supraspinatus tendon on the humerus. And we see an awful lot of signal inside of the distal aspect of the tendon of the supraspinatus, which imaging of the, with MRI has got some complication in this particular area. We have what's described as the 55 degree angle phenomenon, where we end up with fluid, the appearance of fluid in the side of the supraspinatus, which in fact is just a phenomenon that we see that's predictable with an MR. In this particular case, we can't know for sure that this tendon has got a bunch of fluid in it but we definitely see a positive finding for, uh, for some degenerative change around the insertion point. I think I got another image here. 
as this continues to disrupt, delaminate, and potentially uh, completely rupture, then we'll see elevation of the humerus. In this particular case, it's a dramatic appearance of that elevated humerus. It's been there for a long time. We see lots of DJD of the humeral joint, as well as some spotted change at the very top end of the humerus. Fun stuff, isn't it? At least it is for me. Maybe guys, not so much fun. Predictive, though, in many cases. And you really, as a practitioner, look for patterns of injury like you see in the knee, in the shoulder, common locations where your athletes are coming in with pain. So they are predictable. And if you are concerned about bony injury or if you're concerned about soft tissue injury, choosing the right imaging modality can be tricky. Uh, but some of, these, some of these images help us determine exactly which imaging modality is, is likely going to be the best for that, for that particular patient. Guys, any questions on this? Anything in particular? I can, uh, I'm happy to go back and look at an image if you would like. There's some great other additional images in here. Yes? One question about um, MSK diagnostic ultrasound. Yeah. Um, incredible positive movement going in that direction. Um, I think for us as, as current and future sports chiropractors, um, not necessarily radiologists, I don't think radiologists necessarily own MSK diagnostic ultrasound. Nope. Um, I think a lot of radiologists agree to that. I think sports providers certainly could own that and specifically sports chiropractors. Um, what I like about it is it's incredibly portable. It's pretty hard to put a x-ray in your suitcase, yep. right? But to put a computer and a diagnostic ultrasound. The wand, if you will. Wand. I yep. didn't say wand, but I didn't know if that was right. It sounded yep. too Harry Potter. Right. Um, but it seems like it's very portable. One of our colleagues, a sports chiropractor, was down at Rio working with the World Rugby Federation. He had his, D, his MSK diagnostic ultrasound right there, able to look at MCL sprains and, and, the, and the like. Very easy. What steps would you suggest that we take um, to implement that maybe into our practice? In other words, what types of certifications or licensure is there in order to be able to provide that service? Would we be reimbursed for it? Yeah, it's a good question. In fact, the, uh, the advancement of MSK ultrasound uh, is not owned by a radiologist. It is, in fact, owned by uh, a small group of chiropractors that have been doing this for a little while. Uh, I'm trying to remember his name. He is a DC, but he's not a DACVR. And he's taken this particular uh, imaging modality to the, truly to the next level when it comes to diagnostic uh, imaging for the MSK. So what is it that you should do? Uh, my, the name escapes me, but he has a series of training uh, courses for the DC or for the MD to learn to uh, to perform the... Roy, the is that a, What's his name? Roy, is that a, No, that's not what I'm thinking of. So I, I'll get you the name, but he's a series of, uh, of classes you can take for sure. And of course, getting the, the, uh, the right equipment is essential in this particular case. The advancement of the, of the tool itself continues to, uh, to push the envelope of its util utilization. So as the, as the tool gets better and better, we find better uses for it. But uh, as a DC and a sports-related uh, doc, this is probably one of the best tools you could possibly put in your tool bag when it comes to on-site imaging and even imaging inside of your clinic. It is expensive. Uh, the tool itself is expensive. It's not a cheap item. Uh, but like you said, incredibly portable, and you can take it with you wherever you go. So, uh, Tim, I'm, I'm happy to uh, partner with you and, and, and identify the courses that can be taken. Uh, Dr. Kettner at Logan, in particular, has a great fellowship that he's built around MSK imaging using diagnostic ultrasound. Uh, it's uh, those guys in particular are really pushing the envelope for us as well. So, uh, the DC world has really gravitated to this. To this uh, Imaging like reimbursement. So reimbursement, um, that's a trickier piece for sure. Uh, I think the uh, reimbursement still is uh, evolving when it comes to being able to charge for both the, uh, the technical piece of it as well as the, uh, as the professional piece. I can get you more information on that as well, but it's a little trickier for sure because we are, uh, you know, as a, as a DC, you can, you can write your own report, an extra report, and charge for it. Uh, the reimbursement piece for ultrasound is still kind of evolving as well. Are you all interested in ultrasound evaluation? 
It's a difficult one, as you can see. It looks like a snowstorm, right, on a, on a screen. Um, as you get trained, though, you understand exactly what it is you're trying to find or look for, just like an x-ray. Uh, it's not random. You are imaging in particular planes, and you're looking for particular pieces of tissue. Although it looks awfully uh, daunting to read a, an ultrasound scan, uh, it's just a matter of looking at them with some frequency and identifying exactly what. So it's very uh, operator dependent, which makes it a wonderful tool for the practitioner. You're not just looking at an image that somebody is providing you like an MR, you're actually running the tool yourself. So you can feel the anatomy and decide exactly what plane of imaging you're trying to, uh, to look at that piece of anatomy with, and then you can then expect what it is you're trying to see. So, but interest, yes? Not so sure? Yeah. Is it Dr. Thomas Clark? That's it? That's it? You actually apparently uh, stayed at the late cap on North and North Patients. They are running a course in Norfolk, Virginia, October 17th this year. There you go. So that's it. Yeah. Like Such a difficult name to remember, Clark. <laughs> Any other questions? So ACR uh, is a great uh, imaging, uh, sorry, is a great tool for you in the sense of its, uh, its criteria document. I would suggest even knowing about that is a step in the, in the right direction when it comes to determining what image you're going to use. Uh, but that, uh, that little insert that I said is, is probably just important, if not more important. If you're choosing to do any type of imaging and you have a differential that you've decided on, uh, does imaging change your management of any of those differentials? And that's really you know, the, uh, the first step in deciding on which imaging modality you're going to choose, if at all. Right. Well, guys, thank you for being here. It's, uh, it's 10 after 8 now, so I'm sure you're probably tired of listening to me and ready for something more exciting. So thank you all for being here this morning. Thanks, yeah. Thanks everybody for attending. Every third Thursday, put on your schedule. Um, please sign out. Um, you don't have to sign in. If you've already signed in, you're good. Uh, but please put your name on the, on the check in there. And then if you have a survey, if you just want to write a couple comments, that'd be great. We'd appreciate it, especially for future topics.